Christian Bryant. Our physical office space here is still pretty empty, but our show is filled to the brim. Here's what we got for y'all. Playing video games for cryptocurrency isn't just a Mad Lib headline for our modern age. It's the reality for some folks in developing nations who lack other job opportunities. Plus, the threat of a labor strike in Hollywood is still looming with the potential to upend production of your favorite shows and movies. But first, here's our top story. Some of you overachievers out there may already be planning your holiday shopping lists, but for the rest of us, you might want to get moving on that a little earlier this year because some new changes the US Postal Service made this month will have us waiting longer and paying more for mail this holiday season. The Postal Service is temporarily raising prices through December 26th on all commercial and retail packages sent within the US. That's temporary, but they're also making a more permanent change, setting longer delivery times for first class mail. The USPS says the changes won't affect most mail sent locally, but their estimates show nearly 40% of first class mail will be affected, primarily things sent long distances or cross country, and those packages could take up to two days longer to arrive. Critics warn the changes could have the biggest effect on people living in rural or low income areas. An analysis of USPS data by the advocacy group Save the Post Office found some of the longest delays will occur in the West and parts of Texas and Florida. USPS used to set a target of three-day delivery for mail anywhere in the lower 48 states, but now it can take up to five days and the hit can be harder in certain parts of the country. For example, if you live in Washington, D.C., the slowdown affects you if you're mailing to most places west of the Mississippi which make up just over a quarter of all mail sent from there. But if you live in, say, West Palm Beach, Florida, the slowdown affects mail to most areas outside the Southeast. Almost two thirds of mail sent from there will now take four or five days. When you slow down the mail like this, you are actually harming people who are the most dependent on the postal system. People who tend to be more rural, more lower income, who tend to be older. And so it's really disenfranchising them. Now, why is the Postal Service doing this? Because they have a requirement almost no other companies have. The USPS has to fund health benefits for retiring workers years in advance due to a requirement Congress passed back in 2006. There are proposals to get rid of the requirement, but none of them have passed yet. It's not something that's in the typical actuarial table. You don't see a private corporation trying to do this. And it's responsible for as much as 90% of the financial losses the Postal Service has had, where they're supposed to pay five and a half billion dollars over a 10 year uh, compressed time window. With this kind of a financial burden, postal officials look to ways to cut costs. The Postal Service hopes the slowdown will help them financially in the long term, but it also has a pretty immediate effect on the ground for people in certain parts of the country, particularly if they live in more rural areas. One spot already being hit hard is Montana, where small business owners are already seeing the slowdown's effects in action. Newsy's Maritza Giorgio has more. Once the leaves start turning, chocolatiers Anna and Jason Willenbrock know their busiest season is knocking on the door. The online sales um, is very seasonal. It's going to start ramping right now for the holidays and we'll go all the way through around Mother's Day. Uh, and then the wholesale business is all year round. At the start of the pandemic, the small business owners quickly flipped, trying to boost more online sales, which make up about 50% of their business. They rely on the United States Postal Service to ship across the country. I can only Im imagine the logistics. It's, it, it's, it's a huge operation. But then an unexpected challenge. We added a, a note that was in every page, like saying, this might be delayed. Soon, customer holiday favorites meant logistical nightmares. I first started noticing a delay on my shipments around Easter this year. We did try to promote heavily the Easter egg, since we've been doing for about eight years, uh, it's been getting bigger and bigger. But this year, the Willenbrocks had to eat a lot of those Easter eggs and we're not talking chocolate. Not only they arrived past Easter, but some didn't make it. <laughs> but frustrating, yes, yeah. Not, not only for me, but for the customer, right? They, pay, they paid a lot for that to get there. It's a special and, and you know, it's their right to be mad and I could do what I could do is just apologize, refund them, give them a gift certificate, a discount next time. That was all before October 1st. 
That's the date a new USPS policy took effect to slow delivery from three days for standard first class mail to up to five days for parts of the country. The USPS says about 61 percent of its first class mail won't see any changes, but in the crosshairs. Rural America is going to be hit disproportionately hard by this. USPS policy expert Paul Seidler from the Lexington Institute says the plan means mail delivery slower than the 1970s, when the standard was one day delivery within 600 miles. There have been various uh, studies and graphics which have uh, pointed out that it's going to be uh, western states, states west of the Mississippi, that are going to be especially hard hit. Postmaster General Louis DeJoy introduced the plan in March to combat $87 billion in losses between 2007 and 2020. The goal is to cut USPS costs over the next 10 years, but it's now cutting into some businesses' bottom line. I just had to upgrade on my end to just make sure, you know, that customer gets what, what he pay for. You're not going to fix the Postal Service's problems by delaying mail. You're just going to make them worse. It, it, it's, a, it's a ludicrous suggestion. And to especially do that at a time when you've had a 9% rate, rate hike already in 2021, it's, it's, it's almost like you're screaming at people that you don't want their business. It's not just Anna and Jason. The new delays pile on top of existing ones for many small rural businesses. There's been more delays. We had um, a piece of mail that was mailed. I think Jessica said it was mailed from Terry, which is about 45 miles away on September 16th. We got it on October 5th. It should have gone to Billings and back, but it went to Maine <laughs> and then here. The Eastern Montana Grain Elevator had to start accepting online bill pay to ease the burden, but that's now costing them more. Closed USPS processing centers mean to send a letter down the block in Circle, Montana. It needs to make a nearly 500 mile round trip to Billings first. We can see why things are delayed. Ahead of the peak holiday season, the USPS plan also includes new temporary price increases, widening the gap between small businesses and retail giants that can afford to offer free shipping. I think unfortunately I'm going to have to increase the, sh the, the shipping costs so I can upgrade those and make sure they get there on time. For now, businesses like Pashako Law will keep doing what they can to get their deliveries out the door and onto their final destination. I love when I get the orders, but I get a little nervous depending when they go. And Anna knows she can control when she boxes up the shipment, but the delivery date, that's out of her hands. Maritza Giorgio, Newsy, Missoula, Montana. So you're probably sitting there thinking, is anyone going to do something about this? Who came up with this? The mail slowdown is part of a big cost-saving plan from Postmaster General Louis DeJoy. He was appointed last year by former President Donald Trump and faced a lot of controversy over the handling of mail-in ballots and holiday deliveries during the worst phases of the pandemic. Yeah, that's the same Postmaster General who people accused of sabotaging the mail last year. He's still around mainly because, unlike a lot of appointees, his role isn't one that turns over automatically when a new president takes office. The new restructuring effort that he's pushing also cuts back on airmail and office hours of some post offices, but does invest in new mail trucks and vehicles. DeJoy has defended the plan since rolling it out earlier this year. We need to reorganize ourselves, which is part of what this plan uh, 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 will, will do to address uh, 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 you know, address uh, the, the marketplace. But we also need to get more, get better at operating our network as a whole. But USPS officials have found some issues in DeJoy's plan. The Postal Service's regulators put out a bipartisan consensus opinion in July. They said they were worried these changes may not even improve the service's finances. Democrats in particular have been highly critical. Democratic attorneys general from 20 states and the District of Columbia have written to regulators in opposition to the changes, saying they would be especially harmful to rural and low-income residents who don't have many other alternatives to USPS. And members of Congress have also spoken out. The House Oversight Committee has written to DeJoy, and they want answers too. One member of that committee is Representative Brenda Lawrence, a Democrat from Michigan. And as you know, part of the committee's responsibilities is overseeing the USPS. She spent three decades uh, at the USPS, and we're welcoming here to talk with us a little bit about some of what's going on. Representative Lawrence, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And 
Uh, it's significant to note I am the only member of Congress who had a career, a full 30-year career with the Postal Service. I want to start by laying out a hypothetical for you, if you don't mind. Um, I'm going to give you a new job today, all right? Okay. You have just become the Postmaster General, right? Um, understanding that there are some service changes um, uh, that are happening to the USPS, uh, how would you address those problems in delivery and getting mail to people all across the country? If I were the Postmaster General, first of all, if I truly believed that this plan would elevate and protect the integrity of delivery for our mail system, which is a constitutional requirement, then I would pilot it. I would, I would make sure I have the data to show, but to just do a clean sweep across the country of changing the delivery standards and raising costs at the same time, to me is not leadership. It's just, I don't know how to fix it. So therefore I'm gonna dummy it down and make sure that we don't have to worry about doing our job. Now, what sort of effect will this service change have on people in your district and folks around the country? So a, a lot of my seniors use the postal service for, for prescription drugs. They use it, some of them are old school, they get their check in the mail. Uh, and the timeliness of that is critical. So to tell someone a letter is coming from one part of the state to the other, which was usually an overnight delivery, and it makes sense you're saying, oh, no, we're going to change that to three to five days. Are you serious? Three to five days. So therefore, incompetence is now being elevated as the norm. I'm curious to know, you know, what sort of plans are in place in Congress to help bolster uh, the post office? So first of all, we have a postal reform bill that we're working through the sausage machine right now. Uh, to try to get um, funding to the Postal Service and to relieve them of a, a debt that they have to Social Security, which the Postal Service is under the Civil Service Retirement Plan, but we pay into Social Security. No other federal agency does that. We have a pretty rare opportunity here to talk to somebody who has had experience at the USPS. What can you tell me about the morale of postal workers in this moment? So I will tell you, I was very much in contact with the Postal Service during this pandemic. And few people realized they are first responders. We did not shut down the post office during this pandemic. I can tell you from being a postal employee, I sorted mail, I delivered mail. I was a letter carrier and I walked door to door and I took pride at the end of the day my truck was empty and now to have someone that don't have that faith or that trust in you that you will get the mail delivered and they're confused because i can tell you neither rain sleet snow or, or a doom of night will and you know stop the postal service right representative brenda lawrence making it plain for us on the usps and what's happening there thank you so much for joining us Thank you for having me. Two roads diverge in a yellow wood, and sorry, we're going to take the rockier one. We're pulling off to check in on today's trending topics before getting back on the road. See you in just a bit. Welcome back, gang. Our trending topic segment of the show is usually a chance to dive into some weird stuff as you've probably seen, but we also like to reserve this space for taking you through some of the other heavier things that got y'all talking. So let's get into it. Ahmaud Arbery has been trending this week as the trial against the three men accused of murdering him gets underway. Arbery, a black man, was shot and killed while on a jog in Georgia last February. The final moments of his life were caught on camera. The graphic video showed three white men chasing him down and shooting him at close range. The release of the video, which came months after Aubrey's killing, sparked outrage as protesters demanded answers in his death. 
Jury selection is one of the first steps in this trial, but with a case that has become so highly publicized, people have expressed concerns over whether it's possible to find truly impartial jurors. Jury duty notices were mailed to 1,000 people in Glenn County, with 600 ordered to report Monday. The remainder will report next week if needed. What's going to happen is first the state and then the defense are each gonna have an opportunity to ask you questions. By early Tuesday afternoon, the judge had yet to declare anyone fit to remain in the final group. The three men on trial have pleaded not guilty and face life in prison if convicted. The Justice Department also charged them with federal hate crimes and attempted kidnapping in connection to Arbery's death. Washington State University fired the state's highest paid employee this week after he chose not to comply with a mandate that all state employees get vaccinated against COVID-19. The non-compliance with this requirement renders him ineligible to be employed at Washington State University and therefore can no longer fulfill the duties as a head coach of our football program effective immediately. Head football coach Nick Rolovich and four other assistant coaches were let go by WSU. To his credit, Rolovich had signaled as early as this summer that he was not getting vaccinated and kept his reasoning private while also encouraging his players to follow through with getting a vaccine. Rolovich's firing seems like a pretty rare case of a public figure and his direct reports being fired for not getting vaccinated, despite reports of potential mass walk-offs because of mandates across the country. That included rumored walkouts from Florida doctors, commercial airline pilots, and F-22 pilots, none of which actually ended up happening. Three, two, one, let's jam. Netflix just dropped the first teaser trailer for the much anticipated live action adaptation of Cowboy Bebop, starring John Cho, Daniela Pineda, and Mustafa Shakir as the misfit band of mediocre bounty hunters. I gotta agree with Asher Vo on Twitter, did not expect so much Scott Pilgrim in this sneak peek, the paneling, some of the action shots, etc. But Scott Pilgrim was rad and Bebop fans like myself are hoping this will be too. But if you're not sure of what to make of this teaser, the official trailer will drop in a week, and there's still so much to be excited about. The original anime series director consulted on this project, Yoko Kano, who did the original score, is back, and the showrunner assured fans that they'll be delighted when it comes to Ed, the lovable teenage genius. The live action series premieres November 19th on Netflix, but if you can't wait that long or you need a refresher, you can also catch the animated series on the same platform starting October 21st. Imagine playing video games as a full-time job. And no, I'm not talking about YouTube or Twitch streamers with thousands of followers or the growing industry of esports competitors. Recently, there's been a rise in play to earn video games. Basically, blockchain has allowed cryptocurrencies to become the focal point of games like Sandbox, Crypto Kitties, and Axie Infinity. Players can earn the virtual currency and then go trade it on the digital marketplace. In Venezuela, where cryptocurrency has become a widely accepted form of currency, these games are changing the way people work. Latin American correspondent Mari Trini Mena takes us to Caracas and introduces us to one family who is playing the game to earn some extra cash to help them get through the deepening economic crisis. It's game time at the Rodriguez home in Caracas. Everyone is focused on the popular play to earn game, Axie Infinity. Players acquire, feed and train characters called Axies that are then leveled up and sold to other players sold for cryptocurrency that can then be traded for cash. Ruth Rodriguez is unemployed and pregnant. She started playing Axie Infinity in July. It's a huge help. You get this extra money after investing one or two hours of your time. Una hora. This summer, Ruth's sister, Argelit, quit her work as a saleswoman so she could play Axie Infinity full time. She says now she's her own boss, working fewer hours while staying home to watch her children. Digamos que primeramente una bendición. It is a blessing and a lifesaver because it's an income that you can count on. The whole family joins in playing Axie on their phones, even Ruth's seven-year-old son, Derek. I throw the cards and I have to kill the creatures, and then the cards change to coins, and with the coins you earn money. 
Every Axie account requires an initial investment of about 1,000 US dollars, money most Venezuelans can only dream about. Ruth and her sister are sponsored by account owners from outside Venezuela, with whom they share the profits every month. Venezuelans are coping with an inflation rate of nearly 2,000% in the last year and a minimum wage of less than $2 a month. For many, the opportunity to earn hundreds of dollars a week from a few hours playing video games is an easy way to level up their lifestyle. Active Axie users worldwide went from 30,000 in April to 1 million in October this year, mostly from countries hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic, like the Philippines, Brazil, and Venezuela. These days you tell people, look, there's a job available, and they ask you, how much will it pay me? No, they say, I prefer to stay at home, taking care of my home and my children while I'm generating an income. I think people are betting more on this kind of job. Cryptocurrency expert Victor Teoptisto Costa says now more than ever, Venezuelans are using cryptocurrencies as a payment method, relying on foreign currencies and cryptocurrencies to preserve their incomes. In Venezuela, the purchasing power has dropped. If you are earning 30 or 40 dollars monthly and you are getting an extra income of 100 dollars because you are mining using video games, there is simply no discussion here. Three out of four Venezuelans currently live in extreme poverty, according to a recent national survey of living conditions. For now, the Rodriguez family is thriving despite the crisis, using their time to play video games and the profits from that to make ends meet. Maritrini Mena for Newsy, Caracas. Many thanks to Maritrini Mena for that story. Up next, earmarks. That's not to be confused with dog ears, the fold in your page to keep track of where you left off reading. We're talking about earmarks on Capitol Hill and why Congress decided to bring them back. Sunday nights, Newsy takes you to the edge. Exploring untold stories. It's literally an existential threat. Going far beyond the headlines. Today, social media is the real world. Hey, grandkids. There needs to be a bridging of the gap. In real life, a next generation news magazine. New episodes, Sunday nights at 8.30, 7.30 Central, only on Newsy. You might have noticed that infrastructure negotiations on Capitol Hill seem to be going nowhere fast. There's definitely a joke in here somewhere considering roads and bridges are major types of infrastructure. As long as we've had Congress, we've had congressional gridlock. But in past decades, there's been one tool for greasing the wheels that in recent years have created a bit of friction. Earmarks, basically extra spending that gets plugged into bigger bills, has become sort of a dirty word in politics as we see from our friends at the Washington Post video team, while earmarks can lead to corruption, it can also lead to deal-making. We can't afford bridges to nowhere. The Teapot Museum, the corn husker kickback. The U.S. Senator accused of wasting millions of dollars through earmarks. For years, earmarks were vilified as wasteful and corrupt spending. But now, a decade after Congress banned the practice. Today, Republicans uh, adopted an earmark ban. Congressional Democrats are bringing it back. Today, I'm announcing that the Senate Appropriations Committee will again accept requests for congressionally directed spending items. When a member of Congress inserts a line saying, here's a certain amount of money that's going to go to a specific project, usually in that legislator's district, that's an earmark. The origins of the modern day earmark debate began in the 1990s. In 1998, a famously powerful transportation committee chairman, Bud Schuster, ran that committee. And he came up with an earmark system in which basically every member of Congress could get earmarks. Our country needs to be tied together more closely in transportation than ever before. In 2005, Don Young of Alaska was chairman of the Transportation Committee, and he took what was already a pretty big earmark system 
and blew it out of the water. It was always transparent. I was always proud of my earmarks. I believe in earmarks. The explosion of earmarks combined with infamous projects like the Bridge to Nowhere and the Big Dig brought new scrutiny on the system. This is Gravina Island Highway, but there's no one on this road. Many locals call it the road to nowhere. So the more this went on, the earmarks began to look like they were part of a corrupt system. And in fact, they were. White House contacts with now convicted lobbyist Jack Abramoff and his associates were far more extensive than the White House has ever acknowledged. And he built an, an entire practice that was just based really on earmarks and getting earmarks to their, his clients. Democrats sought to clean up the earmark process when they regained control of Congress in the 2006 midterm elections. Strengthen the definition of earmarks and strengthen criminal and corruption laws. And when Republicans retook the House of Representatives in 2010, fueled in part by a Tea Party wave that campaigned against wasteful spending, they ended the practice altogether. Put a moratorium on earmarks until we have a balanced budget. Earmarks have become emblematic of everything that's wrong. But also at the same time, you had a Democratic president, Barack Obama, who had only spent four years in Congress, and Obama had never served on an appropriations committee. He didn't like this, this look either. If a bill comes to my desk with earmarks inside, I will veto it. When Democrats announced the return of earmarks in February, they added new checks into the system, including a cap on earmark requests for each member and additional transparency measures. Earmarks are, to be clear, not the sort of magic bullet solution to all of the things that ail the congressional appropriations process. Historically, earmarks have not always been especially transparent. The current approach that Congress is using does have a lot of um, transparency in it. House and Senate Democrats, along with House Republicans, have voted to bring back earmarks within their caucuses with a hope that this will spur more bipartisanship and less brinksmanship. There's been a situation in Congress for a while now where the minority party doesn't like to authorize spending proposed by the majority party. And it's led to a lot of government shutdowns. We are now six hours into the nation's first government shutdown since 1996. Day one of the government shutdown. Major parts of the federal government are shut down. The idea of bringing earmarks back would allow rank and file members to get some of what they want included in spending bills, though not everyone agrees. And if they have earmarks and we don't, hopefully you knock out the earmarks mm. and, and therefore you have less spending. They're trying now to find this middle ground, doing away with a lot of the corruption and the wasteful earmarks and instead trying to do stuff that is just good for each individual district. Kudos to our partners at the Washington Post for that one. Next up, some of your favorite shows and upcoming movies may be affected if the crew members don't get what they see as fair treatment. More on that up next. You may have heard a bit about IATSE this past week or the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. It's the umbrella union for 150,000 theatrical crew members, including grips, cinematographers, editors, costumers, hairstylists, and more. Y'all do know what a grip is, right? That's somebody who works in cinematography, adjusting camera, lighting, and electric equipment on set. I just looked that up. You might recognize IATSE's logo if you've ever sat through movie credits, or you might remember them from this show when we mentioned their historic strike that was originally planned to start yesterday. But over the weekend, a tentative deal was reached between the union leaders of IATSE and major Hollywood studios, represented by the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. So the strike has been called off for now, but the union members have yet to vote on the proposed deal. And these negotiations are a biggie for a few reasons. Firstly, this will be the first time the massive union would have held a walkout since World War II. That was back when the union was run in part by the Chicago mob. Movie studios bribed them to shut down the labor disputes. Yeah, they was kind of wildin' in Hollywood. But secondly, a strike of tens of thousands of crew members would shut down dozens, if not hundreds of sets, just as production is returning to pre-pandemic levels. It also matters because it signals a reckoning in the industry around long-standing workplace problems. One of the main concerns from union members is the increasingly long hours that take a toll on health and sometimes make it dangerous to drive home. That's not a new problem. 
Anecdotally, fatigue-related illness and car accidents are alarmingly common in the industry. What is new about working in Hollywood today is how the pandemic and the streaming wars have exacerbated many of the underlying problems. Studios have filled up production schedules to quickly get back to normal, lengthening hours in order to film for fewer days. The push inspired union members to speak out online about the brutal working conditions, especially on popular pages like the Instagram account, Ayatsi Stories, which was started this past summer. Crew members also want to ratify past agreements with streaming services for more compensation and funding for pensions and healthcare, which is standard for major Hollywood studios. Past agreements designated smaller streamers as new media, basically saying, you don't have to pay these yet since you're just getting started, you can pay us back later. Well, the union is now arguing that a lot of these streamers are no longer new media. Now the proposed deal makes some headway on these demands. But many union members have already voiced opposition to the deal. For for example, some have said the proposed turnaround time isn't enough and is just more of the same. So while a strike has been averted for now, it's hard to say how the ultimate vote will go. What is certain is that all eyes in the entertainment industry are on this deal. It can send shockwaves through a massive industry that has been resistant to change and has prided itself on a willingness to do whatever it takes for the show to go on. So we're not done talking about this just yet. We wanted to bring in an actual crew person to talk about their experiences. Jade Thompson has worked in costume departments out in LA and is a member of Local 705, uh, a union under IATSE, and they are here to talk with us. Jade, thanks so much for being with us on ITL. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> so the first thing for you, uh, from my understanding, standing, the pandemic spurred a lot of conversations around workplace safety that's been going on. Um, I think one of the most valuable things that you can offer up here for our audience is um, some of your experiences. I mean, can you tell us how working conditions have changed during the pandemic? There was a lot of pressure on studios to pump out a ton of content and a ton of um, shows and all this thing, all this stuff that, you know, had been on hold for several months due to pandemic. So um, there was a lot of pressure on them to get the gears moving fast. Um, and once they started moving fast, they just kept moving faster and faster. So the days got longer. Um, now we're shooting through lunch, what, what should be a lunch. Now we're, you know, instead of camera rolling for 12 hours a day, it's rolling for 14 hours a day, 16 hours a day. Uh, in some cases, 18 hours a day. And this, you know, doesn't include um, our commutes to and from work, which can be on location and change every day. So that may be an additional hour of drive time added to your 16 to 18 hour day. Not safe, not sustainable. So I, I think that initially this was kind of a um, temporary fix, but it has now become the new norm. And it's not sustainable and it puts a lot of us in really unhealthy and dangerous situations. I'm curious to know if there's any difference in what you've seen between um, uh, streaming services and major production studios. Is there is there any difference between um, what those people are experiencing and, and could you talk about that at all, at least from your from your own personal perspective? Streaming services, I think that gets under our skin a little more because um, they don't have to pay into our pension and health plans the way that major studios do. It's bigger now than, an ev than ever before. Um, everything is moving to streaming. Even major uh, network shows are moving to streaming. Everything is accessible via streaming. So now we're saying we want our share and we have the earnings reports to prove that you can afford it. So give us our share. Do you think social media has played a role in helping drive this conversation forward? I mean, better question, what sort of role do you think social media has played in, in driving this conversation? It's interesting you bring that up. I feel like um, social media has played a, a massive role in this particular negotiation. Um, I feel like the locals, uh, the 13 locals that are in negotiations right, negotiations right now together um, are more connected now than ever. Um, there was a, an anonymous Instagram 
account that started up um, earlier on this year. And and all they do is anonymously post crew stories. Um, a lot of them are alarming. A lot of them are scary. Um, I feel like 50% of them, I was like, wait, did I write that? Everyone relates to these things that are popping up on this page um, and realizing um, we're deeper in this together than we thought we were. We're going to take care of each other now. So definitely much more unified, much more solidarity. I want to thank you, Jay Thompson, uh, somebody who has worked in costume departments in L.A. and a member of Local 705, a, a union under IATSE. Um, thank you so much for joining us on In The Loop. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Next up, we're going to move on from Tinseltown to small town America to hear some major success stories from communities that fought back against COVID. Stay with us. Saying the pandemic has been devastating is an understatement. Many people have suffered great losses and struggled to stay afloat, but one town in New Hampshire has put a focus on teamwork and lifting the community up during this difficult time. National reporter Matt Pearl tells us how residents in one rural town have come together to keep their businesses up and running as a part of our Two America series. What people don't get about small towns is that it's just a community wrapped in a small place, right? I'm Luca Paris. I'm the owner of Luca's Mediterranean Cafe. My name's Ted McGreer. I'm the owner of Ted's Shoe and Sport. My name's Lisa Scoville, and I am a photographer in Keene, New Hampshire. My name is Joe Tolman of Bulldog Design in Keene, New Hampshire. Keene is a, it's a unique place. It's kind of isolated. Two hours away from Boston. It's three hours away from New York. Definitely a small map dot. However, there's enough people here that care about one another to make it work. No one could have predicted a, a worldwide pandemic that shut down the entire world. There's several towns right across the border in Vermont, New Hampshire, that their downtowns are just kind of vacant. We had to almost kind of save our city. Our focus was no negative, no negative notes at all. I mean, I mean, this whole interview came to fruition because of the roll of toilet paper. We knew a toilet paper shortage was there, right? At the very first day, every to-go bag got a roll of toilet paper. And then I wrote, we got your back, dot, 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 side. But what started happening is they got home and they laughed. We put on, I, I think, um, arguably one of the first virtual races in, in North America. Instead of paying for an entry fee, they would basically buy a gift certificate at a business of their choice. We raised about $25,000. The Great Gray Tea Project it was creating t-shirts for local companies that they could sell um, and we would produce and they would receive the proceeds. Little Key, New Hampshire raised $110,000. I called people to do front porch photos, but I also started taking shots of people who were continuing to work through the pandemic. I wanted to make sure that everybody got the recognition that they deserve and also the people at home got a connection with human people that they're not able to see right now. That Tuesday when they closed our restaurants, I found out that same day at 8 o'clock in the morning that my dad had COVID. There were times I thought when I got off the phone it would be the last time I talked to him. And then the next thing I know is I have to turn around and be upstairs and we're talking about putting, new, uh, putting toilet paper in bags to make people smile. We had to all get through it together. I think the biggest part of this was if, if we don't all get through this together, what do we look like at the end? Now we're in 2021, how's business? Business is amazing. Hi folks, how you doing? I mean, I have never seen so many people come through our restaurant doors. Our sales are, are good. It's very busy. Has surpassed the best year we've had in 21 years. And you're primarily walking in these. Uh, we're probably up about 32%. What we call neutral cushioning. I do think people came back with a vengeance that we never anticipated and our business flourished in 21. I look back and I'm really proud of how our, our little city kind of came together in a small town like this, it was remarkable. Sometimes there's a lot of competition or people think about what they could do to make sure that they're surviving. I think the key to surviving is helping the people beside you. People are confident in the support they're gonna get from the community and it doesn't matter what it is, people step up and help. This is my team, these guys are amazing. I think it stems totally from doing for others at the same time that you know it's gonna benefit you without even trying. 
When something goes on, everyone comes together and makes it happen. Now's the perfect time to connect with us on social media using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. You can also at me on Twitter at Bryant CP, but with great access comes great responsibility or something like that. We're closing the loop when you're back. It's time to see the bigger picture, widen the lens, narrow the divide. We must love and support one another. That support is shifting and it's shifting toward concern for climate. It's about the whole community stepping up to help. Not everything is left or right, good or bad. The human capacity for change is so inspiring. It's time to look closer at the whole story. A hurricane don't care what your color is or how much money you make, it affects us all. It's time to ask, why? The whole goal is to point people to something bigger. Introducing a new point of view, yours. Newsy, watch free 24-7. It's almost time for us to say goodbye to you, but first, let's make sure we're closing the loop and giving you a quick reminder of today's top stories. The Postal Service is temporarily raising prices through December 26th on all commercial and retail packages sent within the US. That's temporary, but they're also making a more permanent change, setting longer delivery times for first class mail. The USPS says the changes won't affect most mail sent locally, but their estimates show nearly 40% of first class mail will be affected, primarily things sent long distances or cross country, and those packages could take up to two days longer to arrive. Critics warn the changes could have the biggest effect on people living in rural or low income areas. An analysis of USPS data by the advocacy group Save the Post Office found some of the longest delays will occur in the West and parts of Texas and Florida. USPS used to set a target of three day delivery for mail anywhere in the lower 48 states, but now it can take up to five days and the hit can be harder in certain parts of the country. So to tell someone, a letter is coming from one part of the state to the other, which was usually an overnight delivery, and it makes sense. You're saying, oh, no, we're going to change that to three to five days. Are you serious? Three to five days. So therefore, incompetence is now being elevated as the norm. You may have heard a bit about IATSE this past week or the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. It's the umbrella union for 150,000 theatrical crew members, including grips, cinematographers, editors, costumers, hairstylists, and more. But over the weekend, a tentative deal was reached between the union leaders of IATSE and major Hollywood studios, represented by the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. So the strike has been called off for now, but the union members have yet to vote on the proposed deal. And these negotiations are a biggie for a few reasons. Firstly, this will be the first time the massive union would have held a walkout since World War II. Secondly, a strike of tens of thousands of crew members would shut down dozens, if not hundreds of sets, just as production is returning to pre-pandemic levels. One of the main concerns from union members is the increasingly long hours that take a toll on health and sometimes make it dangerous to drive home. That's not a new problem. Anecdotally, fatigue-related illness and car accidents are alarmingly common in the industry. So while a strike has been averted for now, it's hard to say how the ultimate vote will go. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. You can watch new episodes of In The Loop weeknights at 9 p.m. Eastern. We've got more coming your way, so stay tuned.